Okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you for uh, being here in beautiful San Diego. Uh, I want to bring the uh, RIPA board meeting to order. Uh, first off, uh, you know, we've, had a, we've made an attempt to have these meetings throughout the state, uh, Sacramento, Fresno, Los Angeles, and now San Diego, to ensure that um, all, all segments in California at least have some reasonable access to these meetings. Um, so with that, our first, uh, first action we need to take is approval of the January 26, 2017 uh, meeting minutes. Has the board members had an opportunity to review those minutes? Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. We have a motion. Is there a second? second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there opposed? Is there any abstentions? Okay. The motion carries. Next, uh, we're going to move on to uh, the selection of a new co-chair. And um, we had a vacancy uh, because uh, Kelly Evans has now uh, worked for the Department of Justice. And uh, I'm, I'm still a little upset that she left me as uh, the co-chair. <laughs> but uh, we do have to move on. So what we did uh, earlier is ask the board members if they were interested uh, who was interested in uh, becoming uh, the co-chair. And we did receive three nominations. And the nominations are uh, Reverend McBride, Professor Everhart, and uh, Micaiah Lee. At this point, uh, there's three recommendations. Uh, I will also open it up to any other member of the board who did not submit his name or was not who was interested in being uh, the co-chair uh, to submit their name uh, for consideration. Okay, hearing none, so we have three. Uh, I'll, I just want to ensure that, well, two of the uh, candidates are here. I just want to ensure that both of them uh, want to accept the nominations. Okay, Professor Everhart is declining the nomination. Um, so that would leave two uh, members to vote on. We'll do this uh, uh, first with uh, Reverend McBride. Uh, board members who are in favor of uh, Me Reverend McBride, uh, please raise your hand. Hope somebody's counting. Okay. <laughs> Uh, those in favor for Micaiah Lee? Reverend McBride, you are it. So look forward to working for you, working with you. That was fairly easy. Great. Uh, moving on, uh, right now we're going to have training on the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. So um, good morning, everyone. I'm Nancy Beninati from, this, from the California Attorney General's Office. Um, before we do our Bagley Keen presentation, I think our um, new Special Assistant Attorney General, Kelly Evans, wanted to welcome everyone on behalf of the Attorney General. Thank you, Nancy. I'm going to stand up so I can see folks. Um, first of all, I do want to welcome you all, and I want to thank this board for all that the work that you do. Thank the Attorney General staff for the work that you do, and, and thank all of the members of the public, community groups, uh, law enforcement, academic mem partners, and others that are here today engaging in this important topic. As Chief Madrano noted, I'm sadly no longer a member of the board or co-chair of the board, but I'm delighted to be able to work on these issues on behalf of the Attorney General. And so he also wants to extend his appreciation to all of you for engaging on this important topic for our state. And the Attorney General is very interested in the work that we're doing for the betterment of the state of California. And he looks forward to attending an upcoming meeting of the board. So with that, thank you all. I look forward to a great meeting today. Uh, I guess I'll stand too. <laughs> um, so. So this morning we decided to um, have um, 
Julia Zufaletto from our government law section give a brief presentation refresher on the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. We did this last year during our first board meeting, but as you've now had some time to serve on the board, we thought it would be a good idea to give a refresher to remind you of what your obligations are with regard to transparency in, in conducting your business as a board member. So um, Julia, um, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, I'm Julia Zaffalato. I'm with the government law section at the Attorney General's office. Our section advises state boards and commissions like yours on how to comply with Bagley Keene and we provide training. Today I'm doing a very short training um, as a refresher uh, on certain aspects of Bagley Keene Act and um, if you have questions feel free to to chime in during the, the presentation and uh, I'll be happy to answer them. I'm really here today to remind you that Bagley Keene is frustrating for board members. It uh, deprives you of natural communication patterns. You may find outside of a public meeting that you want to call up other board members uh, to pick their brain or you may have lunch with other board members and you may uh, want to discuss board business at lunch. It's, it's natural that some that these things come up. But Bagley Keene limits your conversations in these situations. Um, it's not intuitive complying with Bagley Keene. It, it takes a conscious effort, but if you embrace the purposes of Bagley Keene, it might be easier for uh, you to comply with its requirements. So let's discuss the ph philosophy of the Bagley Keene Act. It's, it's important to remember that if the legislature had wanted to um, maximize efficiency, it would not have created this board. It would have uh, directed that your duties be conducted by a department head or a constitutional officer. But instead, it decided that certain types of decisions should be made through a consensus uh, involving dialogue and collaboration among uh, a group of people with uh, different backgrounds and perspectives and viewpoints and experiences. And that the public should have um, participation in this consensus building process. So if you remember these two key philosophies, consensus building and the public having a seat at the table, it's easier for you to remember that uh, your communications outside of a meeting are restricted and there's a uh, very good reason why that is. So the Bagley Keene applies at state on the, at the state level. Some of you may serve on local boards, which are governed by Brown Act, uh, Brown Act provisions by the Brown Act, and there are similarities, but there are differences. And you may see some differences. You may question those differences and just realize there are some differences. And if if you have questions, staff is always here to help you. Uh, there are five types of state bodies under Bagley Keene, but I'm only going to cover two today. The first type, of course, are, oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just, I'm sorry, I was just pointing him about this. <laughs> <laughs> so the first type of state body are those that are created by statute. By default, this board was created by AB 953, and you are therefore subject to Bagley Keene. Another type of state body I'm going to go over today are advisory bodies. And those are any bodies with three or more members that are advisory in nature that are created by a state body <coughs> or a state body member. Last year you created subcommittees. These subcommittees are advisory bodies and subject to Bagley Keene. Other titles of advisory bodies may include task forces, work groups, it doesn't really matter what it's called. If it's three or more members and it reports back to the whole body, it is uh, subject to Bagley Keene. Um, it may not necessarily be just members of this body that serve on an advisory body. It could be really any type of um, group that you've formed or created with three or more members that reports back to the board. There are other types of advisory bodies. And these are impromptu advisory bodies. It may, this could come up, for example, 
when three or more members regularly meet with each other to discuss board business. Now over time, what could happen is that this could become an advisory body subject to Bagley King. <coughs> it may be that the first time it happens, probably not, probably not going to be a, a, a meeting subject to Bagley King. But over time, if it's the same three members and it becomes a consistent practice, um, an advisory body may be created. The, uh, the Act's definition is very broad, and case law has interpreted advi advisory bodies in a, broad, uh, a very broad fashion. For this reason, we've come up with a, a rule of thumb. It's called the rule of two. And this is to um, avoid inadvertent creations of impromptu advisory bodies. And that is that as a board member, you should try not to talk to no more than one other member about board business outside of a public meeting. Um, so new members, when you are appointed, you are subject to Bagley Keene upon appointment. And this is even before you've taken an oath or even before you have attended a first meeting. Even if the first meeting is several months away, you're subject to Bagley Keene. The basic concept of Bagley Keene is that meetings must be open to the public. So let's focus on what is a meeting. A meeting is a gathering of a majority or quorum of a state body to deliberate on a matter within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Well, what is deliberation? Deliberation is much more than final decision making. It includes all phases of the decision-making process. It starts with gathering information, discussing information, and reaching a final decision. It includes collective acquisition of facts, collective exchange of ideas, and then a final decision. So today, this training, because I'm providing it to you collectively, is subject to Bagley Keene. And later on, you have post-training which um, is also on the agenda, and it is subject to Bagley Keene. And remember, the Act gives the public the right to be present not only at the final decision making, but through the whole entire consensus building process. I'm going to go over now what you should avoid doing outside of a public meeting. There are other types of meetings that are prohibited under Bagley Keene. And these are called serial meetings. The Act prohibits these serial meetings. A serial meeting is a series of communications, several communications, although each individually less than a quorum, collectively involve a majority of the board. This could be where uh, it's a chain of communications where board member A talks to board member B who talks to board member C, or it could be there's a hub of a wheel where a board member or even staff talks to uh, several members individually, but um, exchange the comments and, and ideas of, of the other members. So board member A talks to board member B, and then relays that conversation to board member B, C, and so on and so forth. Also, these uh, serial meetings can occur directly or indirectly through intermediaries. Some of you may be part of organizations. Uh, if your organization's officers are discussing board business with other board members, this could result in a serial meeting violation. Serial meeting, uh, the serial meeting prohibition applies to your subcommittees. Uh, so even though you may be talking to less than a majority of this board, uh, it could be that you've just talked to a majority of a subcommittee um, that you created. Again, so going back to the rule of two, when you have a large board with uh, various subcommittees, um, it's the best way to avoid inadvertent violations of serial meetings is to only communicate with one other member about board business outside of a public meeting. Um, technological innovations have actually made serial meetings easier to, to occur. Uh, a serial meeting uh, could occur 
in, in any number of ways of communicating. It could be face-to-face, -face, by email, text messaging, um, even if it's at a public meeting, um, social media, Facebook, Instagram, really any way that you are uh, sharing your thoughts and ideas with other members of the board outside of a public meeting could result in a serial meeting violation. So again, the philosophy behind Bagley Keen is to promote public participation in the deliberation process. So to the extent that um, serial uh, communications are going on in secret outside of a public meeting, then the public is deprived of the opportunity to participate in your deliberative process. Uh, staff briefings, if done collectively, if, is a serial meeting violation. But the legislature has created a safe harbor, recognizing that you know board members want to be able to get information from staff. They created an exception to the serial meeting prohibition. So under this exception, the uh, safe harbor, individual board members may ask staff for information. Also, uh, board members, staff may provide information to board members individually. The caveat is that staff may not share the comments that they receive from other members with any other members. So there's no occasion where you should be getting information from staff or staff briefings in a collective uh, fashion. It should be done on an individual basis. Now that we've gone over what you can't do, uh, there, are, there are forums where uh, you a quorum of you may be present, but it's not going to be subject to Bagley Keene, and I'm going to go over those now. Bagley Keene expressly says that each of you may meet with one other person, and that's not going to be a meeting subject to Bagley Keene. That could be if a concerned citizen wants to meet with each of you individually, that's okay. Again, as long as that person isn't going to act as a hub of a wheel to communicate everything that you say to all of you, then it's, it's okay. You can all meet with that same concerned citizen. Also, you may find yourself at the same conferences, the same social events, or um, other public meetings held by public entities or even private organizations. And as long as you're at these meetings, even as a quorum, but you're not discussing board business with each other, then these other venues or events will not be subject to Bagley Keene. Another type of meeting where, as a quorum, you may attend, you may be present at the same meeting, are uh, meetings of your subcommittees. A meeting of your subcommittee is not necessarily a meeting of the entire board, but there's, there's a strict kind of rule on that, which is, um, Let's say all of you attend one of your subcommittee meetings. It's not going to be a meeting of the whole board, but that's only if the board members who are not members of that subcommittee meeting uh, don't participate in the subcommittee meeting, which means you can't sit at the table and participate in the discussions or sit at the dais. You have to sit and observe only as a member of the audience. A lot of times we get the question, well, okay, I get that I can't be part of the discussions, but during public comment, I can be a member of the public, right? And the answer is no. As a board member, you're not a member of the public. You're a board member. So if you want to attend a subcommittee meeting and you're not on the subcommittee, you can only attend as an observer. <clears throat> So, you know, going back to you, when you're, um, why these m public meetings are important, and it's because the Bagley Keene Act protects certain rights of the public. The basic right is the public can attend a meeting, they can do it anonymously, and they can speak at public meetings. They can criticize the, the board, they can criticize board members, um, and they can do it anonymously. As a board, you can have voluntary sign-up sheets, but no one is required to sign that sheet if they choose not to. Um, also, your meeting locations must be um, 
open to all members of the public, meaning that anyone who has a disability, uh, it, should be, it should be ADA compliant so that they can attend as well. Um, what you can do with members of the public is you can place reasonable limits on how long they wish to address a certain topic. Whether these limits are reasonable depends on the subject matter, um, the time allocated to the meeting, how many people are there to speak. Basically, if you fairly treat uh, the members of the public who have opposing views, then the any time limits should be, um, are usually considered reasonable. Also, the public has a right to request meeting records. A meeting record is any record, any writing that has been distributed to a majority of the board uh, uh, and it's related to an upcoming meeting. So this is important because to the extent you're drafting reports and a draft has been submitted to a majority of the board, this may be a public record and any comments that are provided to majority of the board becomes a public record. So just to go over, just to kind of recap the very brief uh, explanation of Bagley Keene, I wanted to go kind of emphasize some, some takeaways. You can contact staff individually to request information, so long as you avoid sharing that information with other members and staff avoids sharing that information with other, your comments with other members. If you receive information from staff and it happens to be in a global email, we, um, or we actually recommend that you don't reply to all. You just receive the information, and if you have a question, then you email a staff person directly. You uh, are free to communicate with members of the public individually to share your views, to listen to their views. Um, and again, we encourage you to follow the rule of two, which is to discuss board business with no more than one other member outside of a public meeting. So if you're standing in line at Starbucks and there's three of you, try to remember just to talk about something other than board business. And um, since, you, since this uh, topic that is, is, since because of the makeup of the board, you may find yourselves uh, at similar conferences and public meetings. And even though there's a quorum of you, it's okay as long as you try not to talk about board business at these events. So that concludes the things that we wanted to touch on with respect to Bagley Keene, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, regarding Bagley Keene or to clarify anything I went over. Does any member of the board have questions? I have a question, but I have a comment. I mean, it looks like this room is insufficient. We've been talking about having public access uh, for the public to get in here. I mean, we've got people piled against the wall. If we could open the back doors and maybe broadcast this into the hallway so that whoever comes can hear and participate uh, or get more chairs in here. I think it says maximum 90 in here, and I don't think we're close to that. Um, we're working on getting more chairs. I'd encourage everyone to come on in and maybe cozy where you get to know each other really well today, but I think opening this door is a great idea. We put out the call far and wide. They're looking for additional chairs for us, but please, everyone come in. There's room back behind us and just fill in. Yes, please, please come on in. Yes. It's on. Chief, um, <coughs> On that note, I'd just like to remind staff uh, and, and the co-chairs to work with the staff that I think at prior meetings we discussed trying to have the, some of these meetings uh, in the community. I think one meeting was held in, the, in a community setting uh, and also try to do them at different times of the day uh, so that often later in the day community members are more able to participate. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions regarding the presentation? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. The next night item on the agenda is certainly a very important one, which is an update from the Department of Justice on the stop data regulations and the next steps. 
Thank you, Ed. So I'm sure you're all dying to know <laughs> where, are, where are the regs? Where are we with them? We are so, so close. And um, just want to let you know, one of the reasons that it's been delayed a little bit longer than we had hoped was because Attorney General Becerra wanted to meet uh, specifically with all the various stakeholders. So in the beginning of April, he met with a group of law enforcement, a group of academics, and uh, advocacy groups. And so based on our reviews of the public comments and meeting with these stakeholders and continuing to work and refine different points, uh, we also conducted a field test um, of the proposed, some proposed elements, which I'll, I'll get into in a minute. So basically, we've done a lot more outreach, a lot more streamlining of the regulations, making the, what you'll call your template, seem more intuitive and easier to collect data. Uh, so with that, we are hoping to get something out in the very, very near future, um, hopefully within the next couple of weeks. Uh, another piece um, I wanted to give you an update on has to do with some revisions to the racial profiling statute itself. AB 1518 was heard and passed through the Senate Public Safety Committee yesterday. Um, we had worked with Dr. Weber's office, law enforcement, and advocacy, group, advocacy groups to get um, some language inserted into Government Code 12525.5 that does three things. One, it delays the reporting of the first reporters. So there's a group of eight or nine largest LEAs. They are the only group impacted by these amendments, and they will be delayed reporting by six months. So um, Commissioner Farrow, you, CHP would, is in that group, and you would be not required to start collecting the data until July 1st of 2018. Everything else is going to stay the same. So the reporting dates, the deadlines that you need to get that information to the DOJ are the same, but that first group will only collect six months of data. Every, everybody else will start <laughs> as, as, as planned and collect data and start re re reporting on schedule. The other piece is that it clarifies the responsibility of law enforcement agencies reporting information to us that they must ensure that personally identifiable information of either a law enforcement officer or a person who is stopped is not transmitted to the Department of Justice in any open text fields. That's to protect people's confidentiality. And then it further clarifies in that provision that discusses what is a public record. It deletes um, the clause that had been giving people pause and simply states that the information, um, it says nothing, notwithstanding any other law, the data reported shall be available to the public <laughs> except for the badge number or other unique identifying information of the peace officer involved, period. So it strikes that clause that had previously been there that stated which shall be released to the public only to the extent the release is permissible under law. And this makes this statute consistent with AB 71, which is the officer involved shooting data. And then um, what I'm I'm hoping you're all interested in is the field test that we conducted. Um, in the end of April, the Department of Justice asked 14 law enforcement agencies to participate in a field test. Um, those that did participate were the CHP, LA County Sheriff, San Diego Sheriff, San Bernardino County Sheriff, Orange County Sheriff, LAPD, San Francisco PD, San Diego PD, Ventura City Police Department and the Gardenia Police Department. And I want to personally thank all of those chiefs and sheriffs for, for agreeing to participate in this uh, field test. It provided an immense amount of information to us, and I, and I think it really helped inform um, the next version of the regulations. So, so there were nine out of the 14 who participated. 
and what they were able to accomplish during that time period was stop over almost 3,000 individuals. So there were 2,809 stops collected. When we did these field tests, we, um, one of the things we were looking to determine was the length of time that it would take to collect this data. We also added two open uh, explanatory text boxes for reason for the stop and bases for the search. All right, here's the, here's the big number. For everything that we want, we were recommending to be collected, including those elements that are required under the statute and the few additional data elements recommended by the RIPA board and proposed by the Attorney General's office, um, and the two narrative open explanatory text fields, it took approximately two and a half minutes to complete a form. So it was about 145 seconds. The, so the field testing also showed that the median time to complete the reason for stop narrative was 16 seconds, and the median time for the search narrative was 22 seconds. And those bases for search only occurred in one out of every five stops. So that's not, um, if our field testing is consistent with the way it's gonna work, um, that will, that will sh shave a little time off of that. So um, as all has been said and done, as, as you recall, there are basically 13 data elements that are required under um, AB 953 and currently the ones that have been proposed um, are other actions taken by the officer during the stop, perceived, uh, person perceived, uh, sorry, person stopped was perceived to have limited or no English fluency, perceived or known disability of the person stopped, officer's years of experience and type of assignment. Just one additional comment, the, the field test also uh, helped us examine the technology that would be required to uh, collect the data, although it's not necessarily the, the final system, but it was very helpful <coughs> understanding how officers and the different forms that they could collect the data in the field, which would advance ultimately the initial uh, starting point when we start collecting data. And I did want to also mention that we field tested um, another data element. So I, I'm just talking about the elements that we field tested. And we did field test um, reason for presence at the scene. And we are evaluating now, based on feedback that we received, whether or not that should be included or whether we may simply just say, was this a call for service? Um, so as soon as you can see, I think that we learned a lot from the field testing, um, and, I, and I hope that you all love our next version of the regs. <laughs> Tim. Hi, Nancy, thank you. That's very um, helpful, I'm glad you guys did that. Would it be possible um, for us to get kind of a red line version of where the regs are now as compared to the recommendations that came from the advisory board? Um, and maybe if the new version of the regs is gonna be forthcoming fairly soon, maybe it could happen then, but uh, you know, given how much detail and how much we went over, I think it'd be really helpful for us to see the difference between what we recommended and where the regs stand. So when we, we can do that, but when we, pro when we provide, provide the new draft of the proposed regulations, you will be able to see the red lines. But will that, red, will that be a red line as between the prior version of the regulations? I'm interested yes. in the difference between no, I, I, the regs I, and yeah, what we recommend. I got that. I yeah. said we can do that, but okay. I just want to let you know as well that it will come redlined right. from oh, the yeah, prior version. Yeah, yeah, what, right. The yes. Version, but, but we can also provide. We can also provide you um, with what the board had recommended versus. Tim, I'll do that in template form so you'll be able to see the template like outline for the for what data elements and data values the board recommended as compared to what the next iteration of the proposed regulations um, would include. Can, can I just clarify something so the public understands? Uh, the board made recommendations. Uh, the Attorney General released draft 
uh, regulations. They were not the same, so now there's a, a third iteration that's going to come out. So that's those are the sort of the process that we're going through based on public comment and the review that was just conducted. Andrea, you have a comment? A uh, question. Will there be another comment period for the regulations that come out? I think that depends on what the public comments are. Um, so the purpose of the public comment is to let the public make, you know, put their, give their, as their input over the next 15 days. So um, once we take a look at those comments, clearly if there are things that we think need to be changed, then yes, we will be revising the regs and reposting them. So yeah, Andrea, we will have a public comment period. As soon as we repost the next mm -hmm. version of the regulations, that will kick off a 15-day public comment period. Um, mm -hmm. And then depending on what, if any changes we make to this, the regulations following that public comment period, it's possible it could go into a second public comment period, um, but that'll depend. Given the shortness of that comment, initial comment period, what kind of communication is the Department of Justice going to engage in to make sure that everybody knows that the regulations, the revised regulations are out and that they have a 15-day period to comment? So we have about 1,200 people who are signed up to, to the AB 953 mailing list, so it will be distributed to all of those. Uh, we will also be putting out a press release announcing the next version of the regulations. Um, so that goes out to our entire press list. Uh, and then we encourage all of you to distribute to your networks. And of course, it's going to be posted on our website. Yeah. Uh, when, both, when is, both. Oh, including the full, the full rulemaking file will also be, is, is currently available on our website and will continue to be on our website, um, as well as all of the regulatory documents that need to be made public. When will the revised regulations be posted? We're hoping very shortly. Does that mean in hours or days or weeks? We don't know. Shortly. That's the best I can give you. We're waiting for some pieces to come together um, from outside the office, different pieces that we have to deal with. Um, and, and we will be able to publish them hopefully shortly. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not trying to be vague. Um, it could be this week. It could be next week. And I just can't make any promises. Uh, both comment and question. Uh, first appreciation to the Department of Justice for this first stab at uh, the field testing. Um, certainly I think we're appreciative to actually have uh, a timestamp of how much time it's actually, we're looking at uh, law enforcement partners uh, having a need to fill out the data and the stop with two and a half minutes. Uh, another question is, do we have any data that helps us understand how much the average, how long the average stop was uh, from law enforcement agencies? Is there any data that the Department of Justice holds uh, around that just for us to be able to be doing comparison going forward? Uh, and if not, are there ways that you would recommend that uh, maybe that information might be existing in other law enforcement agencies where we'd be able uh, to acquire that? So I'm looking, I believe that we did field test the duration of the stop. Yeah, we, yeah. we, we, we field tested um, the start time of a stop and the end time of the stop. So we will be able to collect, at least based on what the field test was, what, um, what that, how that, the duration of the stop. Yeah, we have done Sorry. some analysis. We've done some analysis, but I don't have the results right in front of me about of what we found. Yeah. I have a quick question regarding the form itself. Is that going to be available for our review to see what the actual, uh, what those data points existed? Is that available to the public too? For your, the one that you use for the test? Yeah, so we're going to be putting the, um, the documents that we field tested will be part of the rec rulemaking record because we're relying on some of them uh, in order to form our opinion of the regulations. Um, we, didn't, we, we've, we didn't field test so, um, a, really a template. It was, it was an online um, interactive piece. So as the officer went through, they would like, if, if it didn't apply, they would move on. So when you see the results, they'll be a little different. We do have a template, but um, 
so yes, you can see it <laughs> once we post the regs for sure. The best thing you can relate it to is a sort of like an online survey monkey. Exactly. Uh, it it was survey did. gizmo. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't was maybe high then. tech. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, so we're hoping that once CGIS is able to create its systems, those times will shrink even more because this was really a rudimentary internet, you know, survey gizmo. And not surprisingly, we also saw that the time that it took to complete a stop diminished um, rapidly as an officer completed more stops and became more familiar with the form. That's intuitive, but it's certainly something we observed. And with training, I think some of the questions that were raised in the, um, in the feedback surveys will, will help answer those questions and further streamline the hey, reporting process. Hey, Nancy, the, the application that CGIS is developing will be more intuitive than the survey gizmo. Well, yes, so sorry. yeah, that's okay. <laughs> will there be additional testing before it's put out to the public or is this the only test that's gonna be ran? So at this time, we're not planning on doing any additional field testing before we put out the next iteration of the regs up. But do you wanna talk about some potential testing like during the process of rolling out the system? Yeah, so once, once DOJ, once CGIS develops the, our application that's going to be used by law enforcement, we will be contacting the, the first wave of law enforcement agencies who will be reporting, and we will be testing with them on the application. Chief. Yes, Mr. Dren. Uh, Nancy and Shannon, possibly. Uh, a three-part question, I think. I think you answered part of it to uh, Co-Chair McBride's question that the information will be uh, made available to us on the uh, stop test data on the testing phase of it. Uh, in listening to the comments, Nancy, it appears that uh, I think you couched it as 16 agencies were offered to participate or were asked to participate and we did not get all 16. Is that? We asked for 14 and we got nine and the ones that weren't able to do it were various reasons in not being able to get get it you know, up and running in time for when we wanted to have the results back. And, and lastly, uh, a couple of uh, meetings ago, it was mentioned, I think by law enforcement, uh, is DOJ's IT personnel going to have the ability to uh, create something that the various agencies throughout California currently have in place for their records management systems. So CGIS is working on an application that we will be providing to law enforcement for them to use as a standalone application or work in coordination with law enforcement agencies vendors to take our application and then kind of incorporate it and interface it with the existing record management systems at each LEA. So our IT staff at CGIS will be working with the different law enforcement agencies and their IT vendors. Okay. Just, I know that we all, we're talking a little bit techie here and, and just for the members of the public, what the last piece was about is if an officer makes an arrest and it, and, and it happens to be as a result of uh, something that needs to be reported rather than doing two, two, double the work, is there a possibility to have that system that they already use to write the reports pre-fill all the information that's required under the reporting under 953, which obviously we all understand would make it a lot easier. And just uh, another point of qualification to go alongside that, I think the reason this was of such importance is through a couple meetings, this continued to be raised that recording this data, particularly around the narrative fields, would cost too much time for the officer to be using in the stop and subsequently create more. It would decrease public safety because the officer would be using more time, but I think the field testing is showing us, at least in these early rounds, uh, that it's actually not going to be doing that, which I think is a positive thing for us to uh, know that the narrative fields and collecting more data is actually going to increase public safety rather than decrease it. I, I'm finished unless anyone has any questions. Okay, any other questions from members of the board? Yes. Um, so I don't, um, I appreciate all the work that you guys are doing and I understand that there's a new attorney general and that sometimes causes uh, the department to 
take different priorities in regard to uh, allotment of resources. I'm concerned that we're finding out for the first time here that there was legislation to delay the implementation um, that was proposed, um, that the board members didn't know about that. And why is it that certain agencies are, are excluded from collecting for an additional six months? We had a mandate to, to get this information by a particular time and to and generate a report based on that information. And so how were those decisions made and why weren't we included in the information about those decisions being made? I'm happy to. That's a great question. And as you mentioned, the Attorney General assuming office in January recognized that this was a critically important endeavor for the state and he wanted to make sure that he had his arms around it fully. So he wanted to come up to speed with all of the work that had already been done and then also hear from himself the perspective of members of the public, law enforcement agencies, advocacy groups, academic folks. And so he had a series of convenings with different folks to hear their input as well. Um, the regulatory scheme, as folks who participated in the subcommittee discussions know, raises a lot of you know, complicated issues, and he wanted to make sure that this was done right. That ended up taking us past the January 2017 original deadline for completion of the regs, but it was important to the Attorney General that this be done right. Um, it's too important to rush. So, he, in those meetings, and also in talking with the author of the legislation, Dr. Weber, talked about the need to do it right, and if the regulations were going to be um, later than anticipated, it was important to also allow sufficient time for the system to be built, the one that CGIS will be building that was referenced a moment ago. Um, it's anticipated that CGIS will need close to a year in doing the work with the you know, hundreds of law enforcement agencies around the state to get the technology systems in place. And so the regulations are going to end up being delayed probably six to seven months past that January deadline where I think we're very, very close to releasing them. Um, and that just pushed it, the calendar back by six months each. So he was in close um, communication with the author's office. And then also, this was a concept, there were no decisions made, but a concept that was discussed with various um, groups. I don't think there was a board, an intervening board mi meeting in that time period, and because of some of the bagley Keene discussions we've been having, there wasn't a natural opportunity to talk, to talk with the board um, as a body about those discussions. So uh, just to be clear, the initial data collection date would be pushed for six months to adjust for the six-month um, longer period regulation, regulation time period, but the reporting of the information uh, back into DOJ, all that is going to continue pursuant to schedules. It's just that those first rounds, the very first round of re reports will be reflecting six months worth of data instead of a full year's <coughs> worth of data. Except that the information at the beginning was that certain law enforcement agencies were exempt from having to report. There was a list, I thought. So the, that has to do with the largest agencies. They're the, they're in the first round. All the rest of them that go by a number of personnel will still be on track. That's correct? That's correct. So, so again, my, my objection is, that, or my comment is more of uh, why wasn't the board notified that this was happening ahead of time and, and why weren't we given the opportunity to participate? I get that we didn't have a meeting scheduled, but a meeting could have been scheduled. I mean, we're supposed to have meetings four t three times a year at least, and, um, and we're behind. Um, it's July. Our last one was in January. And, and so, you know, again, I get that everybody's busy, but... Um, to make these kinds of decisions without the input for the, of the board. I mean, I have, a, I have a constituency, not my particular office, but I'm here on behalf of the Public Defender Association for the State of California. Um, and, and I think other people have constituencies too that we're supposed to report back to. So to come into a meeting and be told, well, it's gonna be delayed again, and the decision was made behind closed doors, and you as a board member don't even know about it until you get here, causes me concern. Um, and I'd ask that that be, you know, conveyed to the Attorney General. Sure, and I just want to sort of emphasize what Kelly said. Um, we, we, can, we looked at these issues um, in convening stakeholder meetings in the beginning of April, and we specifically had to not include board members because the Attorney General himself is a board member, and doing so would have cre violated the bagley Keene Act. So what we did was we convened what we ho hope to be a representative group of 
advocates, ac academics, and law enforcement and met with them all separately. And then during the course of those discussions, it, you know, Dr. Weber had said that she would be willing to um, push back the reporting of the six months. Be one of the reasons being is because the regs have been delayed, um, the information technology systems can't get up and running in time to collect the data by January 1st. And um, you know, Dr. Weber was comfortable doing it that way, but no longer than six months. And so, um, you know, this board has a 60-day, you know, open meeting notice requirement, and I think shortly around in April, you know, we started talking with with Chair Medrano about setting up the next board meeting, and this was pretty much the time that we could do that. Um, so, you know, I apologize. Um, it just went to committee yesterday. It was a very quick moving process. Um, we had proposed some more ambitious language that um, because of the short time in the legislature couldn't get adopted and um, it was changed, um, you know, several times. I, wor I worked with um, the Poor Act Legal Defense Fund and the ACLU and Dr. Weber's office um, and we are hoping to revisit that issue. Um, we think that these are um, technical, we, we didn't, you know, we weren't, we didn't, we didn't hear a strong reaction from any of the people we were talking to as to the delay of the six months and people understood why. But we can always revisit working with Dr. Weber's office in modifying the statute and the legislation. But it really was because the regs have been a tremendous undertaking, as you well know, you all participated in the subcommittee meetings, and that's really the main driving force for the delay of the six months. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks, and I totally appreciate the time constraints and you, know, you had to move quickly. I, I guess I would um, express that moving forward, you know, um, let's think about how we could be more nimble. Um, I look forward to having the Attorney General come and talk to us about his vision for this work. We're just an advisory board. We're only as effective as the advice that we provide to the Attorney General. We're not a deliberative body that makes decisions. So unless we're engaged around advising the Attorney General uh, when there are important issues that come up, I don't have a huge substantive issue around the six-month you know, uh, delay, and I understand the, the, the need for it. But I think just as we go forward, um, you know, understanding how we can participate more nimbly and more effectively um, as an advisory board for the Attorney General, because otherwise there's no reason for us to meet. If you guys can have meetings with stakeholders and get the advice that you need, then that's terrific. And then we're just sort of fulfilling a formalistic purpose because AB 953 says we have to. No, I, I, your role is crucial, um, and we're going to get into that. But you guys have a really big job coming up, and that's preparing the first um, report of the Racial and Identity Profiling um, Board. So that's due on January 1st, and we're going to be setting up some subcommittees. But you're going to have a lot of work to do, and it's going to be a very important report, um, the first of its kind, I think, in, in the nation. And so. Um, don't think that we don't listen to you because we do. <laughs> okay, great. Any other comments? Well, along those lines, we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda, which is a presentation by the Commission of Police Officer Standards and Training on Cultural Racial Profiling Training in California. And as many members of the board uh, know, this is one of the requirements of this board is to analyze law enforcement training under this section. So welcome. I have to make a minor adjustment here. Thank you very much. Uh, Co-chairs, members of the uh, board, my name is Ralph Brown. I'm a bureau chief with the California Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training. Uh, we've been asked to give you an overview of what we do and uh, how we uh, are helping to enforce and um, uh, move the uh, procedural justice implicit bias training uh, down the track for law enforcement in California. So the, uh, for those who don't know, uh, the Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training 
uh, is a body that uh, affects uh, tr testing, uh, hiring, and training standards for peace officers, dispatchers, and other categories of uh, service in California. And uh, our mission, uh, what we go by on a daily basis, is to enhance the professionalism of law enforcement to the communities that we serve. And we do that through education and training. And uh, as everyone here in the room knows, uh, education is kind of the, I guess, the, the groundwork, uh, the, the, the flooring for anything, any, any aspect of professionalism. Our vision is uh, at Post, uh, we try to be and try to help to put out uh, the best training to our law enforcement professionals in California uh, to keep them a world-class organization. And uh, as somebody who uh, visits uh, and reviews uh, media on uh, several different fronts, uh, many other states look to California uh, as the gold standard uh, for law enforcement training. So who we are, who is, who is POST, what, what, is, what do we do, who are we? Uh, we're an entity that serves uh, over 38 million people in California. Uh, we were established in uh, 1959 by the legislature to establish and set selection, training, and standards, hiring standards for peace officers in California. Uh, we have additional uh, responsibilities for public safety dispatchers, record supervisors, coroners, uh, and uh, specialized entities like airport police and railroad police and the like. Uh, agencies sign up to join the POST program, uh, and it's all voluntary. Uh, the, uh, our office is uh, located currently in West Sacramento. Uh, we have 118 employees with three divisions and eight bureaus. Uh, we have a 58-year uh, rich tradition of uh, networking with uh, law enforcement professionals uh, throughout California, organizations, <coughs> chiefs associations, uh, sheriff's associations, CHP, uh, PORAC, uh, CPOA, a number of associations, uh, so we can, as, long, as well as members of the public, so we can help develop uh, the best world-class training, um, bar none. That's our goal. Uh, what's, our, uh, what's our constituency? Uh, hopefully uh, a couple of you are going to say this is pretty amazing. Uh, 118 people in West Sacramento, we serve uh, 85,000 plus peace officers in California. Track them from the time they go through the academy until the time they retire on all their training. Public safety dispatchers, and at, the, at the tune of over 8,000, so we're talking about 93,000 plus records to maintain on a regular basis. We have 600 plus law enforcement agencies uh, that are part of the post, post program. Uh, we have 39 academy presenters. Academies are, everybody starts at the academy level, right? You have to go through an academy unless you're a specialized entity and you only go through a, what's called a PCA 32. For the most part, Peace officers in California have to go through an academy. And uh, we currently manage a ro a roughly 4,000 training <coughs> courses, uh, of which two of the newer ones are procedural justice implicit bias. The uh, Section 13500 of the California Penal Code gives us our authority uh, to uh, manage these programs. Uh, it's established by, it establishes the commission, uh, who they are. Uh, it uh, gives us reimbursement authority so we can pay back, pay for training for law enforcement agencies. Uh, it also gives us uh, uh, auditing uh, uh, authority so we can go out and meet with agencies and ensure that they're compliant with regulations. Uh, we have the ability to develop regulations. Uh, we issue certificates. Uh, basic, intermediate, advanced, supervisory, management, executive, etc. Uh, and then we also have structure and procedures. Uh, 
we want to make sure that the exact same training that is available uh, to the San Diego deputy sheriff or peace officer is the exact same that's available to that group up in Crescent City or Del Norte County, right? Because we're all one state. Our uh, commission is uh, the body that drives us, uh, similar to you folks. Um, they're appointed by the governor. Uh, you can see on the screen uh, a variety of backgrounds between chief sheriffs, uh, supervisors, elected official, um, members of the public, et cetera, and the attorney general is a ex officio member as well. Uh, what we do, we do a lot. Of it uh, Sometimes it blows my mind to uh, see how much work we get done uh, with the amount of responsibility we have, we have with uh, the amount of staff we have. It's, uh, we have some incredible people back there. So we talked about certificates a little bit, uh, information systems, management counseling. Uh, we go to uh, set up counseling sessions for law enforcement uh, executive leadership. There's a chief change or sheriff change. We can go in and help provide guidance there, policy procedure, regulatory recommendations, that kind of thing. Uh, we also uh, course quality control. So we send people out to sit in classes to ensure that what we've all agreed on as far as training goes is being actually fulfilled in the classroom and maintaining that high standard. Our uh, primary responsibilities, uh, selection standards, uh, which is uh, ongoing and a, and a moving train, especially with uh, some of the things that are going on now today with Prop 64, for example. Uh, legislation changes uh, always looks at, has us look at hiring standards and training standards uh, again. Uh, officer and, and deputy training and uh, dispatcher training and, and leadership. Uh, distance learning, we have uh, a uh, ability to have uh, dispatchers and peace officers log in to our learning portal online where they can take training there. Uh, some agencies have difficulty releasing people to go to training, so this allows them to fulfill their training mandates. Uh, and the big thing is uh, we're a resource for law enforcement. Uh, we uh, truly believe most of us are retired uh, in the law enforcement profession. Uh, we still have a nexus to that. Uh, we still honor and uh, respect that field. And uh, we want to make sure that the uh, guys in the field get the most that they can. So that's enough about post. Let's talk a little bit about the nexus to training, uh, testing standards, law enforcement in the in this area of procedural justice. So uh, a history with, uh, law, uh, let's start with racial profiling. So. Uh, racial profiling, we, uh, we've been putting on that training since uh, the early to mid 90s. Uh, so uh, the, the message to the board here and the public is that uh, peace officers in California have been getting this kind of training for years, decades. So uh, it's not going to be anything new. Um, what, the, uh, what the board is proposing is a little bit new, but uh, we're here to work with DOJ to help make sure that that rolls out uh, effectively and efficiently. Uh, 92, uh, we had guidelines for law enforcement for um, cultural awareness, how to do that, how to implement that in your agency. Uh, tools for tolerance in the Museum of Tolerance, we uh, sent officers to that in Los Angeles. Um, uh, sexual orientation training back in 2001, uh, we have a telecourse on a racial profiling update and um, uh, it, it's been around for years. So again, you should know that. Uh, this training, professional training for peace officers in California has been around for a while. Well, with respect to procedural justice, um, so there are, many, there are many components of procedural justice that are, uh, in, that are embedded in uh, community-oriented policing and problem solving. And that's been around since uh, the early to mid-90s. Uh, we've been putting out training on that. In the academy, in Learning Domain 3, and I recall that because I used to teach that course when, uh, way back in my former life. And um, so many of the tenets of what we talk about in procedural justice were embedded in that curricula. So again, peace officers in California have been getting this for many years. Uh, tactical communications, uh, getting people to uh, voluntarily comply, again, 
I've been doing that for many years as well. Uh, and then recently, uh, we started to put together a roadmap uh, working with our partners at DOJ on rolling out uh, procedural justice implicit bias training. Uh, and we just recently took the handoff from the course certification from DOJ. So now we have three uh, professional entities that will be rolling out the training. Uh, it'll be a CSU Long Beach, uh, South Bay Regional Training Center to the north, and then uh, Stockton Police Department. Uh, procedural justice, the future, where are we going with this, uh, what, what's happening? Uh, you're going to hear a lot more about it. We're promulgating the tenets of procedural justice into pretty much every aspect of law enforcement training that we have available to us. Uh, voice neutrality, respect and trustworthiness. Uh, there, our goal is to embed those into the basic academy at various learning domains so they don't, the kids don't just get it one time, they get it periodically throughout uh, all 42 learning domains. Uh, the supervisor course, so when you get promoted to sergeant, you have to go to a supervisor course, it'll be embedded there. Uh, the management course, when you become a lieutenant or higher as a manager, you'll al also have to take that course, it'll be embedded in those, in that, those areas as well. Uh, so we're trying to inter interweave these, the tenets of concepts throughout all of our training uh, curricula, so then uh, people are exposed to it on a regular basis. Uh, post staff will be uh, providing our post commission with uh, regular updates uh, on how we're doing and what we're doing as staff uh, to to push uh, the curricula out, uh, how the training is going, how many officers are getting trained, and, and uh, how many presentations are being made. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to show a video uh, so we we have uh, several types of videos. One is called Do, uh, Did You Know? And uh, the idea is to have them as uh, three to five minute short brief clips to get the message across, whatever that message is. This was on procedural justice and uh, this group should know that uh, uh, we were recently awarded uh, two Emmys uh, for this production. So sit back and enjoy. You know, I knew I was going to get pulled over. What do you mean? I mean, I've been working all day. I'm just trying to get to the store, go home. But I'm a black man. I'm wearing a hoodie. And I knew I was screwed. I didn't know you were black when I stopped you. I was right across the intersection from you, and you rolled through the stop sign. Yeah, well, a lot of people do, but I feel like I'm the one who gets stopped all the time. Sorry you feel that way. I don't know why you may have been stopped before, but I can only tell you why I stopped you tonight. It's because you ran the stop sign, nothing else. Do you understand how scared I am when I get pulled over? Tell me why you're scared. Cops get nervous when they pull over a black guy. And I don't know how this is going to end. I just don't want to get shot. OK, I get it. There's been a lot of things causing mistrust, but I never know what's going to happen either when I make a traffic stop. I want you to be able to trust the police, to trust me. I don't want you to be scared. You're the first cop I've talked to that understands there's problems. And I think that maybe if I could talk to other cops like this, I don't know, I'd be less afraid. If we could all talk like this, maybe everyone would be less afraid. Will you remember this conversation when you come to my car? It matters. 
more than you know. What's up, buddy? Good evening, sir. Good evening. A moment to, sh to give a shout out to Dr. Eberhardt and uh, Reverend McBride for helping to be involved in the uh, initial discussions of all this curricular development. So thank you guys for that. Um, so to conclude, um, uh, the peace officers have been tra getting training, receiving training uh, for many years, decades uh, in the area of community-oriented community -oriented policing and problem solving, uh, tactical communications, uh, cultural diversity, et cetera. Uh, that's been around for many years, so you, you should know that your peace officers are professionally trained. Uh, the efforts of the board here uh, are honorable and uh, professional, and, and we are uh, dedicated to working with you to help you in any way, shape that we can. Um, we know that uh, people are trained to perform a task, they'll do the task, and, and we know that on occasion some people don't do as they're trained, and okay, we have to deal with that. But the vast majority of people that, uh, that are working out there, you should know they're hardworking men and women, and they're doing what they got to do. They're doing the right thing. Uh, Post is committed to collaborating with the Ripple Board and DOJ and to uh, uh, help us accomplish our mission and your mission. Our mission is to enhance the professionalism of peace officers in California. We want you to know we're here with you. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Does any uh, member of the board have any questions? Thank yes, you. I have a question regarding uh, de-escalation. Yes, sir. Is there any uh, ongoing training regarding how to de-escalate stops? I think a lot of people are concerned the fact that an officer can use deadly force when they feel, when they have fearful for their life. And it seems like that can be a badge to execute someone. Is there any ongoing training to, uh, to de-escalate a situation so that an officer doesn't have that that fear that may prompt them to use deadly force unnecessarily. Uh, again, uh, as one of the instructors for tactical communications years ago, <coughs> prior to 2006, um, uh, we are taught how to, officers are taught how to uh, de-escalate. Um, however, to your point, uh, there are some times when officers are presented with situations that are uh, less than pleasant and uh, they have to respond quickly and uh, because the uh, person that the subject is uh, not compliant uh, with the voluntary request to keep their hands on the wheel or whatever the case might be uh, then then that forces the officer to get into a reactionary mode and depending on the escalation uh, of the subject that, that will dictate the escalation of the officer's response so the training's out there they get it uh, but sometimes um, you just can't train for that. You just have to respond professionally. Uh, yes, ma'am. Tim had the next question. I'll try to go in order. I have five questions, but I think they're all quick and probably something you can't answer today. But um, in general, if you know now, if we could uh, find out later, on an annual average basis, right, um, in, it'd be interesting to know how much post-training does a average officer participate in on an annual basis? And of that, how much time goes to uh, bias or racial profiling training, de-escalation training, uh, and also uh, just the basics of, uh, of the legal requirements of a, of a stop or search or arrest? Um, so that's all sort of one question in terms of how much time we're talking about and relative to the total amount of training that a given officer or average officer would get in an average year. And then finally, you know, what do you do, how do you know um, that the training is, is effective or sinking in? Uh, this morning I received a training on the Bagley Keene Act and I hope I'm not tested on what I learned. <laughs> um, <laughs> that uh, great question, sir. So um, uh, officers are required in California to uh, complete 
successfully complete uh, 24 hours of professional certified training every 24 months. Most go substantially over that. Uh, with respect to uh, uh, de-escalation training, and, and, and I would say that uh, the, the, the footnote here is that the, the term de-escalation is uh, being debated back and forth in, uh, in the uh, attorney realm, um, and, and we may be moving away from that and using another term because that involves uh, some other byproducts. So uh, I'll, I'll leave that as it is, and that'll be a topic for another discussion. Uh, but with respect to the, the concept of de-escalation, de uh, that is uh, taught in tactical communications, and that's every five years they have to take that. Uh, and, but the concepts of, of the de-escalation de concept um, are brought in on a regular basis for like arrest and control training, which happens every, you know, within that 24 hours of training every two years. So uh, when the officer comes in and has arrest and control training or firearms training, uh, they're taught about all of the levels of uh, escalation of force, uh, starting with your command presence and your verbal skills. Uh, sir, keep your hands on the wheel or sir, drop the knife or whatever, and then then you escalate from there if you need to. So uh, so that, that happens in, in a couple of different realms uh, throughout that 24-hour cycle. So, so would it be possible to understand um, within that 24 hours, uh, I'm sorry, within the 25 hours, I think you said. 24, 24 hours within 24 months. See how well I'm taking in what I learned. Um, you know, what, what uh, on average, not just the escalation, but racial profiling and bias, legalities around stops and searches, you know, uh, on average, how much of those 25 hours would be spent on those things? And then my other question about how do you know that the information is actually sinking in? Okay, so I'll answer your last question first because I remember it first and I'm an old guy and I'm going to forget. So uh, uh, we know that it seems to be working because uh, the events that are in that realm are, are substantially smaller per capita per officer in California than they are in most other states. So the frequency of, of, of the escalation of force by an officer in California, given the large, massive area and numbers that we have to police are substantially small compared to others. So um, I'm not a, a statistician, a statistician, but uh, it, when you put the numbers, juxtapose the numbers of different states compared to ours, it's, it's much less per officer. Um, as far as uh, search and seizure and loss of arrest go, um, so that's, n that's not a mandated requirement to my knowledge that I recall. Um, for annual certified professional training, uh, but but the other skills like uh, use of force and evoc driving, etc., high risk uh, skills, those are. I'm sorry, just one follow. -up. So, if I understand you, officers are not trained in the legal requirements for a, a stop, a frisk, a search. And arrest. No, no, they are in the academy. Okay. And they can attend additional training after the academy. And they do it on a regular basis, so it's a perishable skill, so they stay fresh on it anyway. But it's not a legislative mandated requirement on a regular basis. I just, I just want to make a point of clarification. As a former prosecutor, I think uh, the prosecutors in the state would greatly appreciate uh, additional officer expertise. Well, let me, let me make they, a point it's available, of, and they do get it. Point of clarification. Those are absolutely the minimum standards that are required under post guidelines. Right. For example, and I'll use my agency as uh, an example, uh, our officers get at least 20 daily training bulletins a month, which they uh, cover every gamut from de-escalation uh, to uh, criminal law to evidence processing, vehicle impounds. Um, and so many agencies have an, uh, many, many more layers of that. For example, many agencies have already done procedural justice, implicit bias training, et cetera. So those are the minimum requires, requirements from by the state. Uh, I think most law enforcement executives uh, use those as just very minimal standards and, and, and certainly uh, supersede them. And I think, uh, Andrea, you, oh, nope, sorry. Well, I do have a question, but I think Judge Lytle Okay. Judge Lytle. It's good to be a judge. <laughs> 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 um, I want to congratulate Post on the receipt of the Emmy Awards. Uh, thank you. I, uh, I think it was a good. Oh, thank you. 
a good presentation. However, I just had a, a, a brief comment with respect to one aspect of it when the young black man and the officer both express quite legitimate assertions of nervousness during a traffic stop. Um, it, there is, however, failure to note that those two assertions of nervousness are not equivalent. The officer has a gun and the power of whatever jurisdiction they're in behind him and a widespread perception that if indeed this black man is harmed by the officer, the officer gets the benefit of a doubt that it's a lawful act. That's right. Okay, so that, that's a very uh, serious failure mm -hmm. in the uh, presentation. I would also take note of the fact that um, I only received post uh, expanded course outline this morning. I found it really interesting. Um, and there are a lot of good things about it, but I, I have a number of comments with regard to some aspects of it, but I don't think that the chair is going to let me take up the time it would be necessary to go into these. So before the meeting is over, I'd be very grateful if you would provide me with a contact at post to whom I can send my, uh, my comments. It'll only be about 45 pages or so. <laughs> Hey, Thank you, Judge. And she actually speaks directly to what this board can do, and that, and that is, uh, you know, to analyze and provide input on law enforcement training. So I, I want to make sure I get everybody in order. Andrea, I think you were next, uh, or uh, Oscar. I'm not sure. She was. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. So glad you went and <laughs> spoke. Um, I had a question about how you uh, assess the whether you're engaging in best practices or whether you're teaching best practices, um, part of AB 953 calls for evidence-based research to guide the training and, and guide the policies and the practices. So in what way are you incorporating best practices, national best practices into the work that you do? And thinking specifically about the de-escalation training, which uh, my colleague Doug Oden brought up and, and was echoed by Tim. Salard, uh, de-escalation is something that is, is a hot topic nationally, right? It's, it's in fact um, paramount to figuring out how the stops can uh, not end the life of an individual. And uh, so very interested in making sure that, that whatever um, recommendations we could be providing through our, that's one of our roles, that 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 we have a clear understanding of what the post-training is around de-escalation, um, that it's taking into, effect, into account best practices, evidence-based research to make sure that we are um, protecting the life and well-being of, of the community. Okay, if you can indulge me for, I'll try and do this in one minute. Uh, how does, uh, does post-training happen? Where does the course curriculum come from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, we reach out to subject matter experts in the field, law enforcement prof professionals, uh, community members, et cetera. We say, hey, we're gonna put on this training. We're gonna put on a workshop to discuss X training. They respond, we look at their resumes, see if they're applicable, if they are, we open the door. We all sit in a, a workshop, two days, three days, four days, sometimes, two or three two-day sessions. What are the best standards? What are the contemporary standards? Let's look at our existing curricula. How can we um, build up, um, make current uh, mm -hmm. our existing training? We'll do the same thing for new training, which is what we did with procedural justice implicit bias training. Exact same thing. Uh, members from the community, law enforcement professionals, executives, um, ACLU, NAACP, everybody was there. Uh, we get those professionals in there, because we don't know that. We know how to develop curricula, mm -hmm. but we don't know, we don't, we don't have the subject matter expertise in it, so that's what we rely on the field for. We put that together, and then we vet it out to the group, and say, is this, just to make sure, is this what we decided? A, B, C, D, E, F, okay, great. We move forward with it. So that's how the curricula is de developed, and that's the best practices aspect of it. So everybody has a voice, Everybody understands the curricular development. And so you are looking, uh, beyond California, you are looking to, to um, 
evidence-based research on the effectiveness of different kinds of training. Uh, and beyond consulting with stakeholders, I guess, that's one form of, of improving the, the training. But I haven't yeah. heard very much about the So I'm going to get to the second the part now. So yeah. the research part of it comes from our friends at Stanford University. So uh -huh. uh, what Stanford is, is doing is the, the, the Spark Center. Uh, we are working with them, uh, have set up a contract to collect data on people who have completed the procedural eight-hour procedural justice course. Uh, they will get surveyed. Uh, in essence, was this effective training? Uh, if it wasn't, what can we improve? Um, how was it effective? Can you explain that? Well, they'll collect that data and then they'll report that back to us. Then we'll make the appropriate adjustments to the curricula. Thank you. Okay, you're next. Oh, um. okay, I can ask. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your presentation um, and I appreciate that you're uh, doing a training on sexual orientation since uh, 2001. I just want to make sure to mention that gender identity is important also. And I want to, um, it's not mentioned over here, about um, LGBT uh, sensitivity training. I think it's important in a very personal way. Yes. I like to hear that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we have a learning domain 42, which is uh, cultural awareness in the academy. Uh, and uh, the recruits spend many hours in that realm. So. Uh, when folks come out of a, uh, an academy in California, they're very well aware of uh, all spectrums of all people uh, that it's important to be respectful to. Okay, but it's not here, so I would like to see it next time. That would That's be fine. really nice. I can, I can arrange that for you. Thank you. I'll ask you next. I just have two questions. Um, is the curricula available online? Um, <laughs> in other words, what you're actually teaching? Um, at post and get so the public can find out what what officers throughout the state are getting and then my second question is you had made mention to of two implicit bias trainings that are now integrated into the post training what are those specifically implicit bias training well so okay so the the course title is implicit by it's procedural justice slash implicit bias boxed into one piece of curricula okay and is it available publicly? I mean, can the public find out what exactly is being mm -hmm. like this thing that was shown to us? Right. I'm assuming that is part of the post training now. Correct. Um, is there a way to figure out what else is being? Shown? I, yeah, I, I believe so. I want to. Um, I want to say that I think uh, so. The so the learning domain books in the academy um, are generally made aware uh, available to the students that are going to go. Um, uh, we can certainly. I, I, Probably, I suspect that we could probably make that available, yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. The, the learning domains are available online, yeah. open. Yeah. Reverend McBride. A uh, couple questions. Uh, one, I want to get a sense, considering we know local law enforcement agencies uh, really view POST as, you know, kind of a premier organization that really helps to raise the bar around training, and oftentimes POST trainings are service catalysts around promotional tracks inside law enforcement agencies and several other pieces. Can you talk a little bit about um, what you all are building around cultural competency for law enforcement officers, particularly uh, myself and others, there's a few other community members who have provided training for law enforcement agencies um, and have been somewhat taken aback that we've had officers who didn't know the histories of slavery, didn't know the history of immigrant communities, the histories around religious minorities, LGBTQ uh, sisters and brothers and relatives. So how is Pulse thinking about creating kind of, you know, high-end cultural competency training that ensures uh, that both for officers coming into departments as well as uh, creating training that would be focused on promotional tracks, that that kind of training is held at the post level so that it's put forward down to local agencies. Uh, and then also, I know there's been this kind of conversation continuing to happen around um, the, the, the conversation around de-escalation and use of force. I wanted to ask, is post thinking about um, is, is post rethinking 
its ideas around use of force training, uh, considering the massive outcry that's happening uh, in our communities across the state, you know, with the continued officer-involved shootings uh, that, were, that are happening. I was just in a video uh, this morning upon arriving here of uh, a, a young brother here in San Diego that was mauled by uh, a dog as he lay on the floor being cuffed by officers. And so um, I'm, I'm hearing about the training. I participated in training, and, and yet I am also very kind of uh, challenged by this idea that, that we started doing racial profiling training 25 years ago, um, and yet we still are finding ourselves in some of these deep dynamics that we're having. So one, can you speak around kind of some of the, your ideas around the cultural competency that POST is, is bringing to local law enforcement agencies? And then secondly, where's POST at around really analyzing a fresh, uh, its use of force kind of training? Um, and, and how can we learn about that in a continued way so that community can also be uh, working to hold our local agencies accountable around that? Thanks. So, uh, use of force is learning domain 20 uh, in the academy. Uh, I don't know when that was last updated, uh, so I would have to go back and talk to our uh, basic training bureau staff uh, to research that. Uh, officers are uh, trained uh, on, on use of force, uh, part of that uh, 24 hours every 24 months, so um, it, it's a contemporary discussion that, that happens on a regular basis. So. Uh, that's all I can say there, really. Uh, with respect to, and, and as far as individual incidences go, like this one in San Diego, I don't have any background. I don't sure. have any technical knowledge of that incident, so I can't comment on it. It would be inappropriate. Uh, with um, respect to cultural awareness and alike, um, so that, uh, there's a component of that in Learning Domain 3 of the Academy, um, and it's also in Learning Domain 42, and uh, it is also in uh, the every five-year refresher course of racial profiling. And I know that because I used to teach that course. So, and, and they do go back to, uh, there's a block of instruction on the video portion of it that talks about this, the aspect of slavery and, and uh, how, how, how things enrolled at that period of time versus where we're at today. So that is being covered. And for someone to say that they're unaware of it, I can't, I can't answer why. One, one quick follow-up. So we also know that uh, some of Dr. Eberhardt's um, uh, data analysis around the procedural justice and implicit bias to principal policing uh, training uh, demonstrated that there was a high value of having community members actually retraining, being a part of training their local law enforcement agencies uh, with the testing that we did. Is there anything that POST is currently working on with respect to local law enforcement agencies to elevate the influence and the impact of local community members with their local agencies, whether POST, if POST does not have that kind of agency, be, be great to know, but we're just interested to know if there's anything that's happening behind the scenes we don't know about. Sure. Uh, so uh, there's a module in the procedural justice training that, uh, that when, when officers go to uh, attend the course for train the trainer, so the idea is we put on a 16-hour train the trainer course, and then those officers go back to their local agency, and then they provide that eight-hour training uh, to their local agency. And in one of the modules, uh, we encourage and uh, uh, implore them to, A, uh, come up with a community member to help them facilitate that block of instruction for the local history, because, again, the history, uh, being as large and diverse as we are, uh, the history in San Diego or Los Angeles is going to be substantially different than it is in Modoc County, right? So, uh, so we have where you encourage the trainers, the law enforcement trainers, to reach out uh, to their local community to ask their local input uh, to help come in and facilitate that course. So, and that's very contemporary. That is happening right this minute. I have one more question. So as I understand it, uh, participation in POST is voluntary, and you have the number of agencies that um, are participating. What percentage of statewide agencies participate, which, would you say? I don't have a exact number of state agencies. State agencies. We're not local agencies, but state agencies. Right. Or okay. agencies generally. Okay. So um, what I can tell you, we did a recent audit, and I believe it was something in the area of 630 some odd agencies uh, that have uh, powers of arrest in California and 620 of them or so are voluntarily part of the push program. 
Okay, yeah. that's helpful. And then um, I noticed that you have 39 presenters. Um, it would be interesting to see what the statistics are on the race and the gender and um, sexual orientation maybe of those presenters are and whether there are efforts to diversify the presenters so that they reflect the communities that these various agencies serve. Okay, I agree. Okay. Professor Eberhardt. The training, uh, just because that's come up several times, and um, I think uh, we want to move beyond um, simply reaching out to subject matter experts to, um, you know, discuss the, the trainings and workshop it that way, but you actually need to have data on the effectiveness of the training, not just what um, subject matter experts think would be good to have in the training. Uh, and I think that's actually been a problem. Um, just generally across the country as people, uh, you know, demand more trainings like these, especially on implicit bias and procedural justice, that typically they're not evaluated. And um, uh, the extent to which they're evaluated is to simply ask, um, you know, uh, people um, afterwards, after the training, whether they like the training, you know, whether the training was effective and so forth. But what you uh, really want to know is whether it's making a difference, uh, whether it's actually going to change uh, police community interactions on the street. And so that's the kind of evaluation uh, that you need. Um, with the uh, principal policing uh, training um, that was spoken about, which is that combination of the procedural justice and implicit bias training that's happening that's um, uh, post-sponsored, um, Stanford's um, contribution to that is to try to actually um, um, have more effective evaluations um, of it. And so, um, so far with that training, uh, we know that um, it's effective at least at um, sort of helping uh, people to understand the concepts of implicit bias and procedural justice more. Um, it's effective in terms of um, leading officers to want uh, better, um, you know, uh, relations with their community members. Uh, they also, at the end of the training, feel uh, uh, more efficacious about that, or they feel like um, they have the ability through their own actions to um, actually move those directions and uh, those uh, relations in a good direction. Um, they also are more sympathetic uh, towards community members and so forth. So I, I, mean, I think we need to um, move more to, um, you know, uh, evaluating um, the, the uh, training on metrics that actually, um, you know, sort of matter for the people who want the training to exist and, and, and to happen. So. Um, I, I think the um, ultimate goal is to know not just uh, whether the training is affecting how, um, uh, you know, the police uh, and the community perceive one another, but uh, whether um, actual uh, behavior um, is, is changing. And so um, we need to, I think that should be the gold standard for this. Okay, we have, I think we have two more questions, and if we could keep them to those two board members to stay on time, because I know there's a lot of members of the public, we have a public comment period, and uh, on several of the meetings we've got sort of uh, rushed to finish the agenda. So next, uh, Mr. Durant. Uh, just a quick point, uh, Chairman Medrano. Uh, first off, I'd like to commend Post and their director, Manny Alvarez, for the work and the Post Commission on the work that they do and reminding uh, this board and the members of the public that uh, then Attorney General Kamala Harris uh, made it very clear that California law enforcement is by far the best trained uh, law enforcement organization in the entire country. And to your point, Chief Medrano, uh, when we do receive the post outlines in our agencies throughout the state of California, many of our supervisors during our briefings prior to going to shift or after shift will be working on a lot of those training briefings that we receive. So to Mr. Brown's point of the 24 hours, uh, there's a continual amount of training going on on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis by each agency that receives those. Thank you. Mr. Slard? Yeah, I was just going to um, tack on to Professor Eberhardt's comments. It seems like um, I think you're raising a really critical point, um, but I wonder if, uh, and maybe we can take this up this afternoon when we're talking about the subcommittees, because it seems like what you're raising is, is goes right to the heart of what we need to be doing, which is whether you look whether you're a committee looking at training or you're looking at uh, other policies and practices, um, you know, sanctions and response when there are problems, hiring and diversity, you know, whatever the different, right, our 
task is to eliminate racial profiling, that we need to know not only the metadata about sort of statewide how we do doing compared to other states or, you know, but, but getting down certainly to the department level and eventually I would suppose to the officer level, whatever, whatever we can do to really understand what's making a difference, right? And what is the, uh, what is the impact and what's changing behavior? Great. Uh, thank you. It's been a good, robust conversation on this, and it's, it's obviously one of our responsibilities. At this time, we have scheduled break uh, till 12.15, so I'd ask that we are all promptly back at 12.15 so that we can move the agenda along. Thank you.